All right. Very good, guys. It is Tuesday night at seven o'clock and it is time for another conversations with Commodores. And I know that if you've been around the program in the last 20, 30 years, since at least 1994, you know my guest tonight, Dr. Roosevelt Noble. Dr. Noble, Roosevelt, good to see you, bud. Thank you for making some time tonight. No problem. No problem. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Well, we have got a good story to share. and We've got so many things to, to go over uh, tonight, but you guys have got to remind me when we get to the end of the conversation, I got to share about Las Vegas. I got to share about what's going on on campus and the summer. I got a lot of good stuff to share about the program. And as you can see behind me, this is, I'm trying to keep up with the progress. This, this photo is about a week to 10 days old. So I'm sure it looks even more impressive, more demolished than that. But Roosevelt, you are on the campus at least yes. most of the, the year. Before we tell your backstory, talk about the current story. What do you, you see on campus? What do you see from the student athletes who you interact with? What kind of excitement? What's going on with that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting time. It it's, um, definitely ages you when you start to see some of your teammates' kids on mm -hmm. campus. Uh, <laughs> and I've seen um, one of them, like Don, Donovan Sheffield, who's Robert Sheffield's son, Donovan was, I remember he took one of my classes his first summer here. Now he's been in a whole job for like four years after graduation. Uh, so it is interesting kind of to, to be around so much youth, so much energy. I had a conversation with one of the football players on Friday. He's a sophomore. And I was just talking about stuff and, and I asked him, how's his business going? And it made, me, it made me think about like, that's a question that we didn't ask back in the day. Like we couldn't mm -hmm. have these other things. That, whole, that had a whole different definition. <laughs> yeah. Your business back in our day meant yeah. your business. Yeah, yeah. Not what you wanted to share, not talking yeah. about how you're making money. <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 it's definitely a different time, but I do love seeing and engaging with all of our student athletes um, and all of our students in general. I, I think it's, a, it, it's something that I have to love doing. If I live on campus, mm -hmm. I'm here, I'm literally on campus pretty much 24 hours a day unless I so when I go to the gym one of my gyms is off campus but other than that everything is everything happens on these 340 some acres at this point in time so how do you decide which of your four different responsibilities with the university you're going to do on a given day how, how do you do that yeah it's it's, it's structured in, in a way that uh some things are, are only seasonal they happen during certain times of the year if I choose to teach a class and teaching is, is something that happens, but there's certain things that I do every day. Like I'm at the Black Cultural Center every day. Um, I'm, I'm a faculty head of house doing a school year every day. And that assistant dean, like those two roles interact every day, but they don't overlap. Um, you know, the college student life, their day, their, their programming day starts later. Looks like I may have some days when I'm up from eight to 10 doing stuff mm -hmm. with the college students. But I've already been in daddy mode already. I've been at I've been in my eight to five all day. I picked mm -hmm. my kids up from school at five. I gave them their daddy time to eight, and then I went out in the hallway and did faculty head of house or assistant dean of college stuff. <laughs> so, well, not not to mention also a guest lecturer from time to time. Uh, you've also got how many students, student athletes, and regular students come through the cultural center on a given week that yeah. you guys have activities, or they're just yeah. there to do whatever it is that's offered. Yeah, we definitely appreciate this the summertime because uh, we don't have the volume. <laughs> we don't have the volume of people in and out of place. But it, it is something that you miss it when they're gone. After about, I, I'm I'm not quite there yet. I got three or four more weeks before I start to say I missed them yet. But uh, you do kind of miss the energy and just the positive vibe and synergy that the building has. But there's a lot of people in and out of this building. We do a lot of stuff, a lot of programming between here and the commons. Like there's always something going on. Guys, Roosevelt is not telling the whole story, and I know he won't because he's a very humble man. I, it's taken me nine months to get this man on this show. Yeah. <laughs> wait till school is out, please. Yeah. Yeah. All right, wait, wait, hold, hold on. OJ, you don't want to start with that. We got OJ Fleming. You want, he says, "What's up?" And I don't even know why, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment his comment. All right, like, what did you say? He said, "We still passing on the classic cat." <laughs> I know what the classic cat was back in the day. Come on, I, I, OJ. <laughs> I, I was actually hope I was actually hoping to tell that story. I was hoping to tell that story, and I knew Juice Juice would set it up. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get to it in just a minute. We got John L. Thomas is in the house. We got oh, let's see, a few more uh, Commodores have rolled in. We got Dr. Roosevelt Noble. He played in the mid '90s for Donardo and and Dahauer. 
and has not been away from Vanderbilt since. He's got four different responsibilities on campus. He interacts with so many student athletes and regular students as well on a day-to-day -day and, and probably everyday basis. But I want to keep for just a few more minutes talking about the vibe on the campus during the yeah. school year. Yeah. And we all know what we see in the public's eye, what's put out by the athletics department and others, uh, including what's over my shoulder, all of the exciting sports related changes. Yeah. And, but it doesn't just impact the athletics department. It's supposed to impact all students, you know, whatever, whatever uh, part they participate, the fans, the sidewalk, the, you know, the alums. I guess from your perspective, with you being, I'm going to call you boots on the ground because you're on the campus, you're a few hundred yards from Jess Neely. Are you sensing from the students themselves as their conversations are being had about the exciting changes, or is that still kind of flying under the radar with the non-student athletes? No, I, I think our, our <laughs> they call them NARTs. Uh, non-athletic regular people. <laughs> uh, Wait, where did that? I've never heard yeah, that, that term. That's, that's the term. They call them NARPs, non-athletic regular people. <laughs> the NARPs are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> the NARPs, that's, that's what the student athletes refer to them as. They refer to them as the NARPs. And what are the uh, what are the students refer to the athlete? They Do just we call them the know that? Yeah, yeah just, <laughs> just the athlete. But, okay. but I will say, there is, there is a, good, a good positive energy. I always love when I see like, uh, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, like the especially I live with our first year students, they have a tremendous sense of excitement. They have a, a, lot, a lot of them. They came to college expecting this to kind of experience this big time sports kind of atmosphere, right? And and for a lot of them, they chose Vanderbilt over some Ivy Leagues where they knew they wouldn't get that. Uh, and so I'm in the SEC, so I want to take advantage of. So yeah, you may see a valedictorian Victorian with his chest paint, and he's the A in Vanderbilt heading over to the, heading over to the football game. Mm -hmm. uh, and Coach Lee and the team, they also do a great job of every year, beginning of the school year, they do stuff like have, almost have like a semi pep rally on right on the lawn, right in front of our apartment with all of the first year students right after they just finished taking their huge class picture. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a good energy and a good positive vibe. I can't, I'm not on the upper upper division, upper, upper class side of campus, but on among the freshmen, there's a lot of pride and a lot of like I know like not to program on certain sports. Sport, I can't program on sports nights. Because if it's a basketball game, they're there. If it's a baseball game, they're there. Football games, they're there. So oh, that's so yeah, good to hear. That, yeah, that's man. great. It, it does sound like there's a real good vibe, from at least with the first-year students, yeah. about wanting to attend. And, and not to get too much off on a, a tangent, the baseball season uh, sadly ended for everybody uh, two nights ago. Uh, we all root for the Vandy boys this time of the year, and they, they have such a great track record. Did you have any first-year players that came through your programs this year who yeah. either played or I mean like RJ Austin kid out of Atlanta I don't know if he came through there RJ Maybe. lived at, RJ lived in my building RJ lived in my building he was my my son's favorite baseball player because uh, RJ won number 42 my son's favorite baseball player Jackie Robinson so he saw RJ coming in the building one day with his baseball uniform on and he was done like that and then and then I actually when I got to I got to throw out the first pitch of one of the baseball games and RJ was the first player and my son was there with me and he was one of the first mm -hmm. but he said, Daddy, that's the kid that lives in our building so he mm -hmm. he he definitely he definitely remembered him. So yeah, that what was a cool. What a cool memories your son yeah. is building, and and RJ, he's he's a special kid. He's going to yeah, be. Yeah, he is. He's, he is. he's already yeah. a very accomplished player. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my question in being is that I mean that's really cool. You know, with you being a former player and and having the interactions, at least from the student athlete standpoint, they probably can relate to you at least on one more level from that standpoint. Uh, even yeah. though we're now considered old heads. You know, us guys graduated over 20 something years ago. <laughs> but um, oh I think early in the school, you actually, on the very first day I met her, I challenged, I challenged him to a push up contest. We, it, it never actually materialized, but I challenged right. him to, on the very first day of the school year. We never had it, though. <laughs> well, if he was lucky, guys, he would have checked out Dr. Noble's Instagram and he would have stayed a far yeah. <laughs> away from because this man works out like a fiend. Now, yeah. Do you work out on your own? Do you have some partners? And you, and you go with certain guys, or is just something you enjoy doing? It's just something I enjoy doing. It's me on my own, usually almost seven days a week. Uh, I mix it up between weight training or cardio training. I do a lot of Orange Theory fitness. Uh, and I go to actually to the rec center, the good old rec center that we have here on campus. I still go mm -hmm. there a couple of days a week. And yeah. 
Oh, that's, that's I, I, at one point in time, I actually used to train with uh, like Johnny Matoria, who played with me. He was in my workout group, uh, Dominique Kroger, Jeremy Bank, Banks, rather. There was a couple of us that used to, when, when we first got done playing for about four or five years, was part of a workout group together. But somehow they just seem to fade away, but you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's jump back before we get to some awesome stories from your days playing for the black and gold. Let's let's take it even further back. Let's talk about growing up in 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 the north in, in the Midwest in Illinois. And how does a guy from Big Ten territory ultimately make his way down down south? It was actually uh, a one phone call um, that my the neighbor of my high school football coach made. Mm -hmm. The neighbor of my high school football coach was an old man. Fred Luke was about 75 years old. Fred Luke's son mm -hmm. was a football coach at Wabonzi Valley, which is where Kirk Williams and Marcus Forrest, who were on the team at Vanderbilt, already played at. Mm -hmm. And so when we got to football recruiting season, my phone went dead. When we got to that, hey, you can start contacting them phase. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to figure out why my phone went dead. And it turned out that, like there was an, another school that had put out a rumor, a false rumor that I'd already committed to them. And so nobody, everybody was like, hey, he's already committed. We backed off. Was it a power five school? You don't have to name the school. It was. It was, it, big, it was a big school. It was, it was a big time school. And they'd already it allegedly said that I committed to them. Now, granted, this is my dream school. And I probably made the mistake. I took some senior, I took senior class photos and like all paraphernalia from the school. So it was like, this is where I'm heading. This is where I was oh, going. Oh, so you really put out oh, that vibe, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really, yeah. And so it was easy. It wasn't a hard sell for them to make. Right, right, right. And, and so I ended up, um, when the phone went dead, Fred was like, you know what? Let me just pick up the phone and call Vanderbilt. He picked up the phone and called Hal Hunter. Mm -hmm. And when he called Hal Hunter, Hal Hunter was the one that told us, oh, he's already committed. And we was like, and Fred, I'm standing right there next to Fred. I said, I haven't committed to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and how Hunter said he he hasn't committed. He's like, no, this is like a Tuesday. And this is like the first weekend of official visits. Mm -hmm. This is on a Tuesday. I was here on Friday. That was my my first like trip to Vanderbilt was on that, that later that Friday. I was supposed to actually take the ACT again that Saturday. Because mm -hmm. I, I won't tell you what my ACT score was because I was supposed to I was planning to take it again right. <laughs> because I knew I needed to approve it. But that was that's how I got here. Like if, if Fred Luke had never picked, probably picked up the phone and not had Marcus Forrest and Kirk mm -hmm. Williams already on that team. Because Fred's son coached them, and so he so he had a relationship with with Vanderbilt, I guess, in that capacity. So he picked up the phone and he, he had Hal Hunter's number. He called Hal, and Hal had me down here on Friday. Wow. Well, th there's so much to unpack there, and I want to tread carefully. But um, was football your first love? Did you always know you wanted to play on the collegiate level? Were you one of these multi-sport guys, and that just happened to be the sport that landed you the scholarship? Yeah, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. I played uh, baseball, football, basketball ran track uh, mm -hmm. and actually lifted weights competitively in high school. And actually, strangely, with Bonzi Valley, that's where we actually would compete at, which was Kirk and Marcus's school. So we would actually go and compete in weightlifting contests. At did, and did you know those guys growing up? I didn't, I did, I didn't know them at that time. Mm -hmm. um, now, I didn't know Robert Simmons because Robert Simmons and I, because Robert Simmons and I ran, tra I ran track. And so we were typically running to each other. Uh, he was from Evanston, me from Kankakee. We were running to each other during track meets. But baseball was actually my, my favorite sport, uh, the sport that I loved the most um, and, and played probably. It, it, my dad always said he, he wished I had to stay with baseball. But for me, I always felt like football was the one that like it was a lot more glamorous. And like it, it, it at a certain point, I started to realize that like football was going to be my means to the end. Mm -hmm. And so that's when the, the scholarship offers I felt like would be much greater. And probably around the ninth grade, the ninth, my freshman year was the last year that I actually did both like because baseball and track were at the same time right. and the baseball coach had to set up to where I didn't have to come to any baseball practices because I would run you know all of my track meets and I would just show up and play in the baseball games uh and then yeah but after that I was like I, can't, I, I just so I couldn't keep doing this so my sophomore year I just mm -hmm. gave up baseball and just did track because I always stayed with track because it was like it kept me yeah. condition for football kind of thing so now, now growing up where you did were, were you a big 10 guy did you even know about the sec was vanderbilt even a a word you had heard before that phone call i had never heard of vanderbilt um i had never heard of Vanderbilt. if i'm being honest mm -hmm. um i had a cousin who uh was playing with lloyd carr at michigan at that time mm -hmm. uh and so that was like a natural draw on the appeal Sure. Uh, okay. So I, I was aware of the Big Ten. There was a couple of other Big Ten schools. I did football camp in Indiana uh, three summers in a row. So 
I was aware of in Indiana and other places around there. Uh, SEC country was, I, I wasn't really, if I'm, I wasn't aware of, I wasn't a big time SEC fan. Uh, we, and we actually, we didn't watch a whole lot of like SEC football up in that area. It was all big. Well, time. And, and you know, in the, the late eighties, early nineties, the SEC wasn't as dominant as it was uh, in the later years. You had uh, Notre Dame was still a big time program, uh, Oklahoma, USC, you know, it was spread around. Miami yep. was still relevant. Yeah, Florida, uh, so State, was, Florida, Florida State with Charlie Well, Ward. I was going to say that was, I, I want to say maybe Charlie Ward would have been right before, right when you were in high school. Um, so, yeah, the, the SEC was not the dominant conference yeah. that it later became. So I'm not surprised that the Big Ten was really, you know, your focus yeah. at, at that time. Well, let's. You, you come down to Vanderbilt three or four days later. Do you come down by yourself or you, did you bring any family with you? Do you remember anything about the, the visit? <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I didn't, Wait, is this where OJ Fleming this, this, this is where OJ, This is where OJ comes in. This okay, is, OJ, <laughs> here's your time. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so I ended up um, coming down by myself. And I never forget, actually, Fred, I didn't own a suit and tie. But I just felt like I needed a suit and tie for this visit. Mm -hmm. Fred gave me one of his suits and one of his ties. So I had this old 75 year old man's like blazer and tie. Nice. <laughs> that I, that nice. I brought down here with me. How big were the lapels? <laughs> it, it was huge. <laughs> it was huge. But I just remember like, even I, I'm from a town that's about 45 minutes south of Chicago, but it's a pretty small town, sure, right? Sure. And so when I got here, um, and when they took us out for entertainment, <laughs> um, I wasn't ready for entertainment. And one of the things that I would say is, is I'm very keen on and, and big on is staying true to my values at all times, right? And so we we get to the entertainment location mm -hmm. and, and I remember I tapped the real fake one. We had been there probably 10 minutes and I was like, can you take me back to the hotel? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I remember at first it was like the record that scratches in the middle of the club when everybody's dancing, it's like, huh? Mm -hmm. and and it was awkward and it was odd but he took me back to the hotel um and i remember when i got back to the hotel for a while i was like i, I never feel embarrassed and I, I never i have an uncanny ability to not care about what people think about this i never felt embarrassed about anything like that that's a but rare remember, quality right there that <laughs> it's hard to achieve <laughs> i remember when i when i got back to the hotel i heard a door open on our floor because we were all standing in lows and heard another door open mm -hmm. uh, and that's when i went down to see who it was it was oj um, so that's when him and I first met and we started, I think he had final exams or he was, he was at BGA and I think he was in the middle of final exams. And so mm -hmm. he stayed back and he was just there studying. Uh, so that's when him and I first connected and kind of became good friends. And he, he jokingly always says like, he wish he had stayed in that mode because he kind of let you tell it. He fell off the study wagon at various points in time throughout, sure. <laughs> throughout his sure. career. But that was just an interesting time for, for me because, uh, I, he was, he was probably one of the, the, the truly one of the first people I connected with and met with, uh, but it came out of a, a place and space where it was me basically staying true to my values. And again, small town living. I didn't, I didn't grow up with entertainment clubs and so I wasn't used to it. You know, my, my, my hometown, I'm, I, I came in in the fall of 86. I'm about what, eight years older than you. And I came up in January with another ball player at a rival high school and it was the same routine that you probably went through. We went to a big steak restaurant, got to meet and greet the coaches and the other recruits. And then you just peeled off and you went out for the night. Nobody asked us what we wanted to do. Nobody <laughs> asked us what our interests were. It was, we're all going to the same place. Yeah. <laughs> whether you wanted to be there or not. Yeah. But I've always thought that the best way to, to handle recruits on campus is you got to know your audience you yeah. got to know who these these guys are because they don't all come from the same space from a hometown standpoint from a yeah. value standpoint from an expectations standpoint some guys that's all they want to do they want to live it up they want to do everything that there is to do i'm not coming home till it's time to change clothes <laughs> you know but then there's other guys that are a lot more uh, serious yeah. and there's nothing wrong with either one they're just there to have their their time yeah. but i'm i'm with you i'm with you oj said he, he was hoping you would convince him to say no that next night so, <laughs> <laughs> well clearly 
whatever your experience was, it made an impression, good, bad, right, or wrong, enough that you ended up signing with Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you can recall that time period, was it, did you, did you commit on that trip? Did you go home and discuss it with family and, and those who you trust? Take us a little bit, because everybody's a little yeah. bit different in yeah. their experience. We, if I remember correctly from that weekend, after we left, the, the, the culminating event was we went to Opryland and it had the longest like smorgasbord line of food that I've ever seen in life. And then after oh, that- in, in human history. Yes. <laughs> yes. And after that, we met with like Donardo, like one-on-one. -on -one. And I remember being in that meeting and trying to commit right then and there and he wouldn't let me. Um, he was, he was, he, he said, you have to go back and take other visits. Uh, but I was like, no, this is this is this is where I want to be. This is where I want to go. But he wouldn't let me commit in that moment. Um, so I actually ended up going back home um, and, and still talking with some other schools. I actually didn't take any other visits, didn't take any other visits. I still was in contact with coaches, but didn't take any other visits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and ultimately, it came down to one of the main things I remember when I met with Donardo and also met with Brad Bates. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brad made a big impression on me as well. Mm -hmm. But Vanderbilt was essentially like the only place that at that time told me that I could graduate in three years, which was rare. Like today, is, that's not as normal and it's not as high today. Tell me why that was important to you at that time. That was very important. I, I grew up very poor, uh, very humble. But my dad always used to say that, you know, education was the one thing that they couldn't take from me. And so once I, once I, after you hear that so much, it mm -hmm. stuck with me that. Football, I've seen enough examples of mm -hmm. people that I knew who left, left my hometown on football scholarships. And football was their ticket, right? And so once, once I saw that, it's like football is going to be my way out. And so um, and then, once, then I also understood what redshirt meant. So my philosophy was if I redshirt my freshman year, if I finish undergrad in three years, a master's degree takes two years, at the very least, I'm leaving that school with two degrees. Uh, so even at 18, my thought process was, if I'm going to give you five years of my athletic ability, I'm leaving with two degrees. I'm leaving with at least two degrees with the goal. And so a lot of other places that in a lot, in a lot of the Big Ten schools that I actually was, um, I had I'd gone on visits, unofficial visits before we officially got to the official visits. Uh, but it was always like, like, you can do this, wink, wink. And it's like, mm, I don't trust that. Uh, Vanderbilt was like emphatically almost to the point of almost wanting to put it in writing that you can do this in three years. Do, do you realize, or did you realize back then, I'm sure you realize it now, how rare, how mature your thought process was as an 18-year-old? I've interviewed or had on this show almost 150 different players, coaches, et cetera. I don't think there's a second person who has communicated their journey that that was their thought process. And this is me uh, applauding you for having a path that you knew you wanted. Because when we're 18, we're knuckleheads for the most part. <laughs> yeah. We, we want to know when's our next meal? When are we going to hook up? We meet up with the guys. When are we going to see the girls? That, you know, you're, you're like a goldfish at 18. It's 10 second extended <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and you're on to the next thing but did you know that about yourself as a, a rising senior headed to college I, I, I I've always been slightly I guess advanced or mature in, in terms of how I think about things um mm -hmm. even um I remember I, I still remember that same year for example my senior year mm -hmm. I, um there was a national young leaders conference in Washington, DC, and I wanted to go to this conference. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents had, had nobody's money to pay for me to go to this conference. Mm -hmm. I wrote a letter. I went and spoke in front of 20 different churches. Uh, my little league baseball coach was a DJ at WKN. I, I went on the radio station and, read it and made a plea. Mm -hmm. I ended up raising, it cost me $4,000. I ended up raising almost $12,000 to go on this trip. And so even then, I've always kind of been mm -hmm. like, show me a project or show me something I want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Let me divide the plan and then I'm going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so for me, college and football was very much in that same vein. Uh, yes, I want to go. I want to have fun. I'm going to do all the things I want to do, but this is all part of a plan. This isn't, 
this isn't just randomly happening to me. Uh, it's, it's been mm-hmm. something that I've thought about and planned out to some extent. Does part of this, as you describe your humble background uh, from a financial standpoint, coming from a small town as, as well, did it add stress to your life back in the day? Or was this just all part of the natural progression of this is just how life is and I'm going to make the this this my path? Yeah, I wouldn't say it added stress to my life because I've never been one to get anxious or, or have anxiety about anything. So it didn't necessarily stress me, but it did motivate me in a sense that like I, I just knew I wanted better. I knew I wanted to do better. And I'm also a person who I, I you don't have to if you tell me the fire is hot. I don't have to touch it. I'm going to take your word for it that it's hot, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, there are certain things that I've had to learn like that along the way. One of one of the one of my idols growing up as a child was a guy by the name of, uh, I won't say his name, but a high school player who I was a freshman when he was a senior. And in, he was in your hometown. In my hometown, in my hometown. He was featured on Sports, not Sports, but uh, in the in Sports Illustrated, the, the magazine. Uh, mm-hmm. He had um, He had one game that I remember like, just going and watching this game, this kid, had, he had like eight touchdowns and 400 something yards. I just thought he was the, the most awesome player in the world. Mm-hmm. I never forget when he left and they went to Marshall. This is when Marshall was first building up as a D1 program. We had about four or five players from my high school that went, they went at like Marshall's first big class. Mm-hmm. And, and one by one, I started seeing all those guys back home within a semester or two. And then I started realizing like the, the tr- tradition was we had people go off and come back. And like, that's not going to be me. I'm not going off and coming back. So I learned from them was like, that's not going to be me. So once I get there, I'm going to do everything I need to do to make it happen. And a funny story about that, one of my English teachers, I'll never forget freshman year when I went home after the first semester and I saw an English teacher of mine, she was kind of a, a little bit jealous of me because her daughter had applied to Vanderbilt and didn't get in, but I was going on a football scholarship. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I saw her at a high school basketball tournament over Christmas break and she asked me, are you going back? And I'm a very witty person. I said, without flinching, they don't give out degrees after one semester and walked off. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, nice. And I think she was like, wow, kind of clutched her pearls kind of moment. But it's, it's kind of, yeah. for me, for me, it was like, I, I wanted to learn. I didn't want to be one of those guys who came back to my hometown and, and had all this potential and all this promise and all this talent, but couldn't make it. You know, it would be easy for me as an outsider, not knowing your story till tonight to say, well, that's, that's motivation. Well, I, I don't think that you even needed a lot of that to happen in your life. That was probably the next layers, if you will. Um, I, I can only imagine just trying to be in your shoes at that time. But let's let's kind of move a little bit forward. You've got Donardo, who's got a, a tough reputation. We're... I, I don't know when Bell Buckle ended, but were you part of the Bell Buckle era? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I experienced Bell Buckle. Um, and, I, and for those who do, that when they're on the show, I give them the option whether or not they <laughs> want to bring up a memory or we could just move on. <laughs> no, I, I, I do, actually. I have a couple of memories from Bell Buckle. One of my favorite ones, though, was, was why I was so glad I was a freshman. Uh, and OJ probably remembers the story as well. When we watched the upperclassmen have to do their gasser test mm-hmm. on that hot turf mm-hmm. and then board on the bus, get on the bus, and we all go to Bell Buckle. And they stopped the bus two, three, four, five, whatever so many miles before we got to Bell Buckle. We kicked all the upperclassmen off the bus, and the last part of their test they had to make it to Bell Buckle at a certain time. With the, and the freshman one on the bus, I was like, oh, my God, if we got to do this shit next year. <laughs> like, and that was that was not... Mm-hmm. That, that was that was not a pleasant memory for me at Bell Buckle. Uh, mm-hmm. And Bell Buckle was rough. I would say it was rough in the sense that um, I got tremendously homesick. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but I, li- I walked into town every day on our break. When we had that two or three hour break, I walked into town and would mail letters back and forth to my high school girlfriend. Oh, wow. Uh, that was, wow. I, I, would, I would put my pants on. So in the event that I came back late, I was already dressed and ready right. to come back. Right. Uh, but I walked into town every day to a little Bell Buckle post office, dropped a letter in the mailbox and walked on back. The first one, we couldn't get to the phone. They weren't giving us like right. uh, at the one or two phones that were on lock kind of thing. So, Wow. Guys, I've got Dr. Roosevelt Noble with us, and he's in the mid-90s playing for Donardo Dahauer. Unfortunately, we're stuck in the Bell Buckle time period, <laughs> but I want to welcome Kenny Cole, 
Tyler Unzecker said he just got finished with the gym. He's swole. He's coming for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> got, <laughs> one of my former teammates, Eric Snyder. Hey, Eric, good to see you. And oh, <laughs> OJ says his exact thought <clears throat> was the same as yours, seeing the guys get off the bus. Yes. What in the hell have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yes. it, would you say, looking back on, on Bell Buck, and we don't have to stay there long, was it as much mental as it was physical? Can you separate the difference, or were they so intertwined that it really uh, impacted you both ways? I, I think it was a combination of both. It, they were very intertwined. The mental of, of being in the middle of nowhere, yeah. uh, and, and literally, like, you, you have to bend. Uh, this is your band of brothers sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And in the physical, because I liked it, it was hot, like, I mean, hot beyond, <laughs> beyond reason. Um, as a first year, like, you know, first coming in, like it was, it was, it was physically demanding. That's physically demanding as it was well, on top of that. The growing business. up in Illinois, you didn't exactly have the humidity of Nashville. Nope. I realized that what's it about 400 plus miles drive. I'm, I'm speculating, you know, from Chicago to, to, so Nashville up 65 is about 500 miles, but that's a huge difference when it comes to that Southern yep. summertime humidity. Daryl Griffin says he's so proud of you. <laughs> yeah, Griffin's in Illinois too. I remember, yeah, he's a good, he's a good one. <laughs> but that humidity is no joke. Did it take you a minute to get used yeah, to that? It, it did. And it's, I'm 426 miles, exactly. I know exactly how far my house is. Uh, yeah, it, 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 was a, it was a unique, unique change. And, and and Griff, I will say, Griff and Kepke, and, and we had a small band of us that were from Illinois, and, mm -hmm. and, and they did a good job of kind of making sure that we, we were all kind of taken care of a little bit. Very good. And Tyler said he owes your, his degree to you. You helped him in two stats in classes. Stats classes, never, yeah. <laughs> that never have passed. So you survive Bell Buckle. It's that first year. It's the fall in 94. That defense, What's the, the, nine, the 90s defense is stacked. Yeah whole bunch of Sunday guys. Were you looking to redshirt your freshman year? Were you competing for any playing time? Talk to us no. a little bit about your journey from a, a from a football standpoint. Yeah, Coach Case had already told me I was going to redshirt freshman year. Basically, for almost from the very beginning, uh, Coach Case told me, look, you'll travel. Uh, you'll travel with the team. Um, but the, the plan is to redshirt you. And part of that was because I played, even though I was undersized, I played linebacker in high school. Um, in all four years, my high school coach had intended my senior year because he knew I was going to be a defensive back in college because of my size. Mm -hmm. He had intended to make a transition, but we had academic issues with some of the players and we made the playoffs and we couldn't. So we, we, yeah. we didn't have the ability to do that. And so Coach Case knew that that transition for me to kind of get out of linebacker mode and kind of embrace strong safety mode uh, was, was, was going to be a process. And so he, he told me going into the year, you're going to redshirt. For the folks who didn't play on those teams in 94, 95 time period, who was sitting there at linebacker at the ones and the twos? Oh, you had uh, Gerald Collins. Um, you had, uh, well, there was Carlton. There was Kurt. There was uh, Gerald Collins. There was, uh, God, man, there, 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 was, there was some beasts there. And you got the Jamie Duncans. Um, <laughs> you had some real – some real like go but yeah you have you have some beast there linebacker uh, and, then, yeah. and across the defensive backfield you also had some fantastic yes. 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 back there yeah eric vans who i don't i don't know where where they made him at uh but <laughs> eric was like six five but ran like a gazelle yeah. uh you had eric vans you had the real finkland you had Corey chavis who was in my class um you had you had, you had a pretty aj uh, anthony jordan who again was cut out of the same fabric as, as, as probably yeah. Eric but it was it was a pretty stout group. I don't mean to to jump around, but I just thought of something. As freshmen, you guys are on that bus at Bell Buckle. Was there any doubt in your mind whether you or any of your fellow freshmen were not going to make it through Bell Buckle? We're just going to just leave and go home. Did that ever, did those conversations either internally or externally make their way into conversation? You know, they didn't. But what's crazy is that we actually had one of our classmates who didn't, who did not make it. Um, I, I, I can't remember at what point he left, but it was within like that first week. He was mm -hmm. this big time wide receiver recruit that we brought, did not make it, went back home. 
But well, wide receivers are prima donnas. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, I know that it served a real purpose. I know yeah. that the coaches have used it in the past, and it does. It weeds out the mentally, yeah. you know, the guys who just can't mentally can handle that. But speaking of handling things, guys, I've got Dr. Roosevelt Noble, and we're just going through his story right now, the mid-'90s, some really, really talented defenses uh, that he was part of. and. If you don't know his story, he's been affiliated with the school for, for decades now. He's got four different responsibilities on campus. So I, I like to say it's boots on the ground because he's mere a few hundred yards from Jess Neely. You see all the construction behind me. And again, that picture is about seven to 10 days old. But did you feel in your mind that you needed that year the red shirt, not just from a physical standpoint from athletics, but what about the academic side of things? You had a plan. You had a either a three or a five year, two degree plan. But did you know that you needed or felt like you needed that red shirt for that purpose as well? Yeah, I did. I did. Academically, it was a big adjustment. Um, and I, I still remember my first English paper. That thing looked like a crime scene. There was so much red ink on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think I think one of the professor's comments was like, have you ever heard of the Bedford hand, student handwriting book? Make it your Bible. I was like, wow, this is this is pretty intense. Uh, and so I, I needed I needed that first semester. I needed that first year to adjust to all things academic, to adjust to being away from home. Um, I had a I had a real major breakdown, like Brad Bates talked me out of leaving. Like, I'm, I'm so thankful that like the transfer portal was not a thing. Uh, because the way I felt on this one particular day that actually they pulled me out of practice and Brad kept me out of practice because I, I was dehydrated crying. I was like, send me home. I'm ready to go home. I hate this place. I can't do it. Brad talked me out of it. Um, but yeah. homesickness. Side, side note, Coach Bates was was the strength and conditioning coach my mm -hmm. years before he transitioned to the administration. What a fantastic guy. Man, yeah. Like, he, yes, yes. You know, he's, you know he was three-time, he, he was at Michigan's three-time uh a decorated player, Rose Bowl player, yep. and just had, I don't know if he was strength and conditioning for you guys at that point, but he had just some unique training yep. skills and things that he put you through. But his number one, and he's been on the show, to me, his number one best attribute was that interpersonal communication between with players who needed needed him. Yep. And we and we him and I have communicated as recent as like the last couple of years. Like it, all while he was at Boston College, all of us mm -hmm. we, we stayed in contact with each other. So yeah, he's definitely he definitely helped. But I needed I needed that year. That year was necessary academically, emotionally, socially for a lot of reasons. I needed that year. When when did you find your? This is my term. When did you find your footing? When did you find out or realize whether it's athletically or academically or socially? From a from a, a standpoint of this is my college, this is where I belong, and I'm not just surviving now. I'm starting yeah. to thrive now. When did that click for you? Second semester freshman year. Um, that, that quickly. That's oh, that's. that's <laughs> was yeah. there was there like an aha kind of pivotal moment that that really you've now shared this story, this part of your journey with students that yeah. you have now. It, it was. Um, for me, when I, I joined the fraternity second semester of freshman year, mm -hmm. and when I joined that fraternity is when I finally really felt like I found like my social group, mm -hmm. right? I had mm -hmm. teammates. Uh, we were very good friends. We would communicate on practice and all of that. But going back to what I talked about values, uh, I'm 47 and I still have never had alcohol a day in my life. Uh, all through college, I intentionally avoided any place that had alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which meant that I didn't, unfortunately, unfortunately, I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time hanging out with my teammates. That wasn't yeah. my thing. Yeah. Uh, I grew up with, alcohol, I grew up with an alcoholic father. Mm -hmm. I, I, I still have trigger, triggering memories of being in four or five different car accidents with my dad because he was drunk. Oh, so wow. that's why I've said I've never, I'm never drinking alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. So staying true to my values about the type of fun that I wanted to have. And my type of fun was, was like once, once I joined that fraternity, we would go do things like laser tag downtown, go canoeing on Radnor Lake. We would do like stuff that to me felt like a safer version of fun. And it was more in line with what I wanted to do. And those guys, when I tell you, um, it was six of us all together. I was the only athlete. Um, there was one athlete in the 
group that was pledging me. He was a former football player who was a senior at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember, like, we would be in, in our sessions, and, and everybody's talking about GPAs. And I was the dumb athlete with a 3.0 GPA from first, from first semester. These guys had 385s, 39s, in engineering first semester. And I, and I remember my dad used to always say, you hang around smart, you get smart. You hang around stupid, you get stupid. And, and so to this day, I credit those guys. Second semester, freshman year, I had a, my GPA was a three. I went from a 3.0 first semester to 3.7 second semester. Mm -hmm. At 3.7 second semester was the lowest GPA I ever had in the remainder of my time at Vanderbilt. Uh, but it was because of those guys pushing me. And uh, there was also something else that happened that same semester. Bernardo mm -hmm. left. Bernardo leaves. That hire comes in. We get a new position coach. Uh, my position coach goes from Ron Case to Perry Fuel. Mm -hmm. That tells us, hey, doing winter conditioning, you have four days or three days, whatever, that if you have a eight o'clock test, exam, whatever, you can miss no questions asked, go take care of what you got to take care of, take care of your academics. Mm -hmm. I miss for, because I had a soci intro to sociology exam. I missed like a workout and we get into our individual team meeting and I'm in there with all of the DBs. Uh, we're all in this meeting and Perry Fuel lights into me and calls me uncommitted, yada, 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 all these different things and, and how I, if, if I left that meeting basically saying, one, I'm going to show you but two, that was kind of my pivot away from the football side. Uh, I started to realize the politics mm -hmm. and I started to realize the ways in which things can be given and taken on the whim of a coach. And Robert Sheffield, uh, and most of those guys can tell you, our conditioning test that spring, it was a 12 minute run on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. And it, it was based on your position. Defensive backs and wide receivers had to run the fastest. Mm -hmm. We had a, like six and a half, Two minutes at 6.5, two at seven, two at 7.5. Then you had to run like six at like some ridiculous eight. I run the entire test at nine miles an hour just to prove a point. Uh, so for 12, and that's when Robert Sheffield started calling me running row row because I was possessed. I was possessed because I was trying to prove something to Perry Fuel, mm -hmm. who didn't think that I could do all the things I needed to do academically and do all the things I needed to do athletically as well. We go into the spring game that year, had two interceptions. Granted, one of them was on a tip ball, but it still counts. Uh, <laughs> two interceptions. I'm in the best shape of my life. All of these things. We get into the fall and the opening depth chart. I think I slid, I slid down four places. That's when I knew. Mm -hmm. that, that's when that, that, that three-year plan that I had in my head became like accelerated. Uh, and so that, that second semester, freshman year, at the same time that I was finding this other community of sorts in my fraternity brothers, I also was kind of starting to realize that like, Football is something that as much as I love this game, it's shown me that it can be given and taken away. And I, I watched so many, like there were some great talented people that I was like, why is this guy not playing? Oh, the coach doesn't like him or the him yeah. and the coach got good about X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, yeah. I, I, I guess I, was, I wasn't used to the politics side of it. And once I, once I saw that and realized like, I, I, did, I just didn't want to waste putting my eggs in that basket. I still, I still played, still lettered every year, mm -hmm. um, but mentally, if you were to ask me where most of my energy, energy and eggs were, they were on the main campus side, side of side of Vanderbilt. You know, it, it's so interesting because you're that experience learning about. I don't know if it's favoritism, politics, however you want to couch it. You're you're right. I think it's it's a lot of times it's it's human nature to treat those we like better better, and no matter what the ones who we don't have favor with. No matter what they do to prove yeah, otherwise, yep. yeah. Imagine if the transfer portal would have been around at that point. Yeah, and, and which I'm really glad it, it it did not exist because I think yeah. my life my life has been immensely blessed by graduating from Vanderbilt. Well, there is a lot, and that that's I'd love to have another conversation with the, like a round table talking about just that. I'd like to have some modern athletes and then some of the old guys. Talking about that, I'm going to call it the stick to itness, yeah. the dealing through all those hard times. I'm not saying the modern athlete is any more or less mentally sharp or mentally strong as we were back in the day, because everybody's made up differently. Yeah. Everybody has different experiences. But when you have less options back in the day, you got to make yeah. the best that you can. But yeah. the other thing that I heard that really struck a chord with me is you, unlike many of us, 
who don't take advantage of that short period of time we're on campus to reach out to the non-athletic community that's out there, the networking, the friendships, the camaraderie, the experiences, too many of us, and I'm one of those, were too wrapped in our football bubble. And too many of my close friendships, and they're still friends today, don't get me wrong, we're from the football team and I love them to death. But you, unlike a lot of us, did take advantage of having that other network, that outlet out there. And these guys, I'm sure you're very closest friends even to today, but it was that motivation you talked about being the, the dumb jock in the group motivated you ac academically, just like the Carlton Halls and all those guys probably motivated you from an athletic standpoint. Absolutely, I see that. It was interesting too, I mentioned that there were six of us that, that I joined the fraternity with. Two of them are on the Vanderbilt Board of Trust currently. No, not too shabby. Not, not too shabby, shabby at all. Uh -huh. um, but, <laughs> so there is it's a very, that network, and we were all in Miami when I, I posted recently about being at a gym down in Miami. All mm -hmm. six of us were down there for one of them with turning 50 when we were kind of just getting together to celebrate a 50th birthday. Isn't that the best? Um, the six of you guys have now been friends. I don't mean to age you, but you're, you know, you're coming on 30 years. You've been together. And, and, and I say this, you could probably say this about your teammates as well in certain uh, memories, one guy in the group in your group text just says that whatever the word is, and it triggers a whole conversation. You guys are all busting out laughing because you have that that yep. shared memory. Not much like with fraternity uh, pledge brothers, the folks on your the football teams. It, it is it, you know we've heard this term. We use this term band of brothers because mm -hmm. it takes you back to all that. Yeah. We, we were knuckleheads except yeah. for you. We were. <laughs> You know, we we just we didn't know any differently. We're all going through it together. And I think that's what's so special about playing team sports yeah. in high school and, and, in, and in college and much like your uh, uh, your uh, fraternity experiences. As, as I, I think that's that's a fraternity in and of itself, the, the football team. Um, sure. The, the same sure. Sense of connection that I have with some of those guys uh, with with rock uh anthony i mean robert anthony asthma like there was there were certain players that like we were we were there together as well um we <laughs> me uh at, at one point in time once things really turned sour like uh i still remember johnny matoria and, and dominique kroger we started this whole slp which was a sideline posse uh it was an slp like we, we had a whole uh uh like we would be in practice and everybody be on the same on the right knee and we had a call and we would like it was it was a whole thing like it was, it oh was you're cracking me up you're <laughs> cracking me up right now because my group there were eight seven or eight of us with my class and none of us really played a lot during our time so we considered ourselves the pterodactyls we were the <laughs> dinosaurs on the team same idea same concept yeah. same, yeah. same thoughts <laughs> Yeah, we had now, to dress up everything. <laughs> the, we were the we were the turret anyway. <laughs> Guys, I've got Dr. Roosevelt nobly played in the mid 90s for Denardo and, and Dowhauer. And I want to go to the Dowhauer, the transition. Obviously, they're two different individuals, different styles. You did not come in with his class. You were recruited with the earlier class. Sometimes that's very tricky um, because I want to say, and and OJ just brought it up. Wasn't it maybe one of those, maybe the first meeting when Donardo was starting to kick older players out? Yeah. Something along yeah. those lines. Do you remember yeah. any of this? Yeah, yeah. He he was very uh there were several guys, like I mentioned, the 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 person even in the fraternity that was a football player who was played to me, he was one of the guys that Donardo kicked off the team. Mm -hmm. Uh so he was a senior here, but Donardo had kicked him off the team. Uh and there was other players. I remember Troy, I think that happened to Troy. There were several players that Donardo mm -hmm. That was that was something that he did. And that's the that's unfortunately, that's the reality, at least then and maybe even now. Look what Deion Sanders did in Colorado. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's Just, clean you're gone. <laughs> because they're, because yeah. and, and, and I know most of us know this. It's a series of one year contracts. Yeah. It's a series, yeah. You know, you don't you don't sign for four years yeah. when you're coming in freshman. It's one year renewable contracts one thing i do love about vanderbilt though is even though it's a one-year renewable they treat it like it's a four-year and, and and they take a lot of pride in the fact that 
they they have as much of a vested interest in getting you to the stage. Uh, I've, I've been haven't been here for the time. I've seen players who I knew who left early for various reasons, mm-hmm. and then you'll see them back on campus 10, 15 years later finishing their degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I and wanna, that's, that's what makes us special. And I, I want to talk about what you see now and compare it to the 90s when you were, were there. They're the Student Center for Success. And, and I'm not, I don't have all the proper names of these departments, but like they posted on social media and it wasn't just football. It was all the new incoming student athletes. They had orientation. And I can imagine it's from an academic standpoint, it's from, from all phases of life on campus. We didn't have any of that when I was there. We barely had tutoring. Yeah. But, but I guess what I'm trying to, to get from you is for us old guys who don't know currently what's going on, I want to be able to stress that Vanderbilt really is doing a great job now with the investment of the student athlete who's there and trying to get them not just for these four or five years, but getting them set up for success beyond, and it wasn't that way in the past. Can you share just a little bit from your perspective what you're seeing? Yeah, I think um, most of us in our recollection of McGugan, there was a staff of about three or four people. Uh, McGugan, in terms of the academic support staff, when you think about uh, like Champs Life Skills when Kevin Colin first came on, and it was still about 10 people. Now there's 40, 50 people of it. Their job is to make sure that they're providing for the holistic Mm-hmm. Student athlete experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they do internships. They do practicums. They do all sorts of stuff that's from day one, right? And, and whether even even this past year, for example, I got emails back in January. It's like they started a new program where um, they were reaching out for mentors. I got like emails from four different random student athletes. Like, hey, I want to just set, 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 schedule a meeting with you to talk about your path and yada yada yada. And I was like, we didn't. We weren't doing that kind of stuff, <laughs> kind of stuff when I was here. And so there's so many different initiatives that they have that are tremendously beneficial in making sure that the holistic picture mm-hmm. of this person's development is met. And I think part of it is they understand like the, the long game. The long game is as we continue to build out and develop and all these facilities and stuff, that's our that's our donor pool. We got we got to make sure that like we're we're really investing because the the the, the more we can invest in them, the, the greater the sense of pride that they feel about coming back, giving back giving up their time, giving up their resources. I think I think we're getting to where we understand that better now. It's not so much of like, get them out the door so we can get the scholarship freed up to somebody else. It's like, no, what are we doing to make sure we're actually taking care of all of this person's needs? I'm sure there's a study out there. It may not be public information, but I would love to figure out or to see how much money is invested in a four or five year period per student athlete. Yeah. And I bet we would be shocked. Yeah. You see how much it is. I bet it. I bet it's going to be in the millions of dollars per athlete. Yeah, yeah. And, and including <laughs> including like uh, I'll see the team on Friday. Over on they started doing these Friday recruiting parties, and I walked out last Friday. I just looked out the window. I was like, those guys look kind of big down there at that tent. Let me go down there. Walk down there. It's a football recruiting party. Uh, mm-hmm. This uh, they we they I don't know how much money they spent, but just looking at it, I was like, they spent a lot of money on this. This is happening every Friday during the month of June. Wow, uh, they, they, it's a tremendous amount of money that we spend just even in getting students to kind of commit to us. Then once they get here, there's all this extra stuff that we commit to them as well. So anytime you have an opportunity, and I'm not to like Candace needs me to make a plug for it, but anytime you have an opportunity to support Vanderbilt Athletics financially, uh, that is like when I give the money to the institution, I give it to two places. I get to the Black Culture Center because I work here and I get to athletics because I see and know what they're doing. Well, I'm going to pause the uh, infomercial that we're putting on what's going on right now. And I want to get back to more of your, your journey, which will bring us back up to, to the current. During the Dowhower time period, talk a little bit about, and I don't normally talk about on-field accomplishments and games because we can, we can read the scoreboards and things, but I do want to ask if you have any special memories, whether it's practicing or, or games Ultimately, to me, it's the camaraderie that was so much more important than the w yeah. It's the friendships. It's the, it's the everyday things that you remember. What, what made the impression? What still makes the impression on your time from that time period? I think some, there was t- the teammates and the camaraderie of the teammates. Um, mm-hmm. I had some tremendous displays of, of, of commitment 
from several of my teammates. I remember Marcus Lewis, for example, uh, who let me live with him uh, for free, uh, who, when my car broke down, brought me to campus every day. Mm -hmm. He was working at Saturn and Spring Hill. We mm -hmm. lived out in Brentwood. He got up and drove me here every day and then went to work every day and then came and picked me up. Oh, my. Uh, so it's like those kinds of things that, uh, like those relationship things. I remember one point in time my car broke down. OJ let me borrow his truck uh, to do to do things. So it was like, like you have those kinds of memories. Some of my favorite on the field things: uh, beating Georgia at Georgia our freshman year on their homecoming, uh, mm -hmm. being at Alabama and and <laughs> watching Beer Mar and Angel call his own fake punt, uh, <laughs> and also and ultimately scored on it. Uh, being there and on the field for that. One uh, so, of the top ten plays in Vanderbilt football history. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like being there watching this kid from Illinois, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, who just called his own fake punt. Uh, so I, I have definitely have positive, fun memories of like the football side, but I think probably the the individual people and and people in particular is probably what I remember, remember the most from football. Yeah, and that that's what stays with you. Yeah. And that those are the guys that are probably in your text thread and text groups, and that you see when they come back to to campus. All right, you get to the end of your football career. You get to a certain point where you just know that it's now time to pivot into that next phase of life and, and just given your focus and your motivation, when did that occur to you? When when was it that you just knew time is it's it's time for me to hang up the cleats? Uh I actually I was still on scholarship, mm -hmm. football scholarship. Mm -hmm. And a professor called me into his office. Uh, and say, hey, do we have this Dean's Fellowship? They'll pay for you to go to grad school and get a PhD. It's for five years. We'll give you this, we'll give you that. Um, I, I left his office and went up, walked up to the athletic department and was like, I got a better offer on the other side of campus. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking my talents <laughs> to the other side. And so that was, that was. Oh, I want to be in your mind space on that walk. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. had to have been. Obviously, well, not obviously, it had to have been a little bit of overwhelming, mm -hmm. swelling from internally. I know you're not a, a boastful person, but you, you've you got to have given yourself at least a little pat on the back saying, I'm I'm accomplishing my goals that I've set off. But I, I did. that walk, I'm just envisioning, I bet your smile is, you know, 10 feet tall, at least internally. It's got to be. It was, and and it was a sense of because again, it was always the means to the end, and the end was to leave with two degrees. But I knew with that scholarship, I was leaving with a, a PhD was not in my like Doctor Nova was not a thing. But when I walked out of that meeting with that professor, it I was is like, oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, oh, that is, that is a thing. And so, yeah. and so I, I tell people, I, I got nine years of schooling at Vanderbilt and never paid a dime. Tell me about that conversation with the coach. Uh, it went easier than I thought. Uh, I think because in, in, in part, this is still part of that era of, of, hey, this is just one more scholarship. I can, I can go and recruit somebody else with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it, it wasn't it wasn't a whole lot. It was a congratulatory and, and very brief passing, but it was very quickly. You could tell it was more or less a, hey. But was, but was that also with the understanding that you were now retiring from playing ball? Yeah. You weren't going to be on that scholarship, but still be on the team. Yeah, no, I, I, that was the understanding that I was retired from playing ball. And part two, because the position coach was still there. I knew that as long as this person is there, I'm not getting on the field. I'm not I'm not going to do what I want, what I, a big part of what I actually chose to come to Vanderbilt for. I suspect you got a lot of love from your close buddies on the team, but did you get any grief as well? I didn't. I didn't. Most of the guys who were like, they knew from day one. There were a couple of like, I remember freshman year, there were still a couple of guys, or one in particular, I won't say his name, but. I'll never forget, like, freshman year, he told me it was the dumbest thing he'd ever heard that I wanted to try and graduate in three years. And that became part of my motivation. Um, but I, for the most part, the guys who who I came in with, uh, the guys who I communicated with on a regular basis, I didn't get any grief from them about that. They they knew that uh, they, they I mean, on some level, they'd all seen and experienced their own version of these politics and games. Sure. Uh, sure. I think some of them were probably proud or even slightly, I guess, jealous to an extent that I had a, I had a way out of it. Uh, and, and I had another something else that I could pivot to that kind of gave me this other other meal ticket that I was looking forward to. Certainly. And, and we've got a few more minutes and I appreciate your time tonight. We've got Jamie Bryant in the house. We've got Elliot Carson in the house. Hey, fellas, thank Hi. you for joining us. Yes, I remember Elliot.
you get to that point now, you've pivoted away from football, you're headed towards your PhD program, but you're still deal. you're on campus or maybe living off campus, but you're still on campus. That next fall, did you miss it? I was still at it. Uh, this, is, this is how I met Tyler and uh, some of the other people. Uh, I was, uh, at one, uh, for one year, I was an assistant strength and conditioning coach with Todd Settles. I helped him out in the weight room. I was tutoring student athletes in statistics classes. Uh, so I was still in Magoobin a lot, even though I was, and this was, this was the immediate fall right after. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so yes, I did miss playing it, and it felt weird. So mm -hmm. something that, you know, playing Pop Warner, you said you play Pop Warner football. So mm -hmm. you've been playing football in the fall since you were six years old. Oh yeah. This is the first fall that you're not like playing. Now I will say what, what also something else I did right that same, that first year I got done, I started coaching a women's flag football team. Um, and so that became my outlet. And I coached that team for 16 years. Uh, oh my gosh. I, I wow. met my, my, my wife was a player on that team. My wife, I met my wife. My current wife was a player on that team. And we played in national tournaments at Texas A&M, at University of New Orleans, West Florida, down in Pensacola. So that became my, I was still around the game, but it was like coaching this team of women flag football players. Mm -hmm. Wow. I should have asked it this way. At what point did you not miss it? Sadly, I don't think I've ever not gotten to that point. Like today, literally walking into the rec center this morning. Mm -hmm. From the rec center walking in, I can see the guys training. Mm -hmm. if, and I, I told myself when I left the rec center, if they're still out there, I'm going to go over and run with them. Uh, because a part of me, um, it, I, don't, I don't regret very many things in life, but a part of me regrets to an extent that I let, I let a position coach take two years of, of a game that I love from me. And, and I know that I still have those two. I still have two years of eligibility. I joke with Coach Lee all the time. So, look, I still got two one years. More play. One more <laughs> play. One more play. I don't know how many plays you're going to get out of these knees, but uh, yeah. I still got two years of eligibility. Yeah. Uh, um, OJ, I'm not asking that. You can ask him that all. <laughs> I'm not asking whether your wife-to-be got any preferential playing treatment. Wow. wow. <laughs> wow OJ, no. had to go there. <laughs> had to go there. You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> Last last topic. I can keep you here for hours. I want to be respectful of your time. But before I get into the last little topic, I want to say thank you for what you've been doing for not just the student athletes, but the NARPs. <laughs> the term I learned. <laughs> Tell them what it is again. NARPs. N-A-R-P. That's non-athletic regular people. That's what they call them. Narcs. Have any of you guys, is this is the old guy in me? Do y'all know this term? Yes. These are the non-student athletes known as NARC. Good grief. I want to thank you for your journey and for how you're guiding young people for all these years. Not just the, the ball players, of course, but all the students who come through there because I know that they're enriched. I know that their minds are expanded. They come from big towns and little towns and everywhere in between, but they get on that campus and they find you or the cultural center or wherever that they come across you, they can't help but be a little bit better each day that they do stuff with you and learn from you. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and we hope that you don't retire anytime soon. But <laughs> you don't have to answer that. But here's here's the question. Here's what I want to ask. We've we've hinted around, talked a little bit about the transfer portal and 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 those kind of things. Not naming any names of current athletes, of course. Comparing your time period and your buddies and what you went through, it's a different mindset today. It has to be. That doesn't make it better. It doesn't make it worse. It's just different. How do you see the success for those guys and women who are, are student athletes that they're so tempted by NIL money or people in their ear or in their DMs, we can get you this kind of just come like the Lawrence kid decided to come back. I don't know anything about what happened on basketball team for him to come back. I'm thankful. It's a fantastic player. We're going to be a great team this fall, potentially, but something struck a chord with him to get him to come back. It's got to be tough on those current student athletes. So my question is, from your observation, how do they how do they tread those waters? How do they stay afloat and not just get overwhelmed 
by what's out there now. Yeah, I think I think it is difficult, and and on some level, it inadvertently and indirectly kind of can eat away at that that grit, right? Because if that if if I always have this open window or this open door, open path out, um, I, I I I I'm I'm a little less gritty. I'm I'm a little less like I'm not going to persevere and stick through it when when I'm being recruited and enticed by other places, right? And and I think it's difficult to kind of turn that noise off to where you you, you don't see it, even if you decide, hey, I'm here in my little bubble. But yeah. you see people all around you, your teammates bouncing, your teammates doing different things and getting NIL, NIL money here and this person thinking yeah. about going here, thinking about going, you can't ignore it, right? So I think it would make it a little more difficult for you to kind of stay focused because ultimately it's a team sport. And, 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 and as you start to think about like who's leaving and who's staying and we all want to be successful, a, a key number of people leave and you start to look around it's like wait a minute i can bounce and go somewhere else right but at the same time i do also want to say at the same time i think it can kind of cut away at some of that that grit and that perseverance and it's very difficult for them to turn off that noise of being forever enticed by what's happened over here what's happened over there i'm kind of glad for it uh in a, in a way because i think um and i saw this i'm, I'm a huge women's softball fan and i'm like i've been eating up the women's college oh we got to get us a team candace I'm, I'm, I've been preaching that all today, uh, but I love that I, I'll see a player who, who, like one of the Tennessee players, for example, she was at Oklahoma for three years, and mm -hmm. and, and it just wasn't working for her. But mm -hmm. found a home and finally found that like that new passion and joy for the game, being on the Tennessee. And, and then she gets to play against her former team. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I, I think it, there can be a good, good, good that yeah. can come out of it because I think if if a coach can leave, and this is something that we all dealt with. A coach yeah. can leave, but you can't leave without sitting out or you can't, they got to give you permission to leave. Like we grew up when we played in that era. And so I do like the, the ability for, for, for players to kind of take control over their own destiny as it comes to, in terms of where they play. But I do think on some level, we kind of inadvertently set them up for, for failure and, and decrease some of their grit by always kind of keeping this window open of, Hey, I can go here. I can go there. Yeah. But I think that, and, and this is in closing, I think that the, culture that coach Clark has created and yeah. creating the trust amongst the teammates that it's their team. Yep. The fact that it's a Vanderbilt degree and not state you. Yep. The fact that our NIL is up and running and successful. I think there's so many things, the student for uh, center for success, getting people set up for their next 40 years. Those things are in place now, and, you, and it showed this past year. I think we had the least number of transfers out from football. And anyway, the, we can pause this for now. But guys, thank you for doing this. One of the one of the true Vanderbilt men. Not only does he come to Vanderbilt, gets multiple degrees, plays ball for us, but is now there and has been for years. Helping to to mold and 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 influence and help those young students who are on campus, the student athletes as well as the NARPs. But <laughs> Dr. Roosevelt, <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. You too. This was this was a real learning experience for me. You sharing your journey has been fantastic, guys. This is why I do these each week and we've got so many more got one of my former teammates a man you know dr Derek payne out okay, of Memphis DP. Is next. Yes. dp is next week yes. and we got more and more and more coming up vegas you guys need if you're going to vegas or have any interest tickets are not available yet they probably won't be until late july august i've got my guy in the ticket office is going to get with us we're going to try and get us a block uh, of tickets we're putting things together for that week ansley battles out in and Henderson, right outside of Vegas, is putting together a big get-together for all the football alums, et cetera. There's going to be a lot of stuff. We're going to have some fun stuff. Keep, keep checking back about all the progress that's going on on campus. And if you, get to, if you get to campus, Coach Lee will not only entertain you, have you into his office, talk to you, whatever you want to talk about, as will Candace and anybody else who's up there. So you guys stick around for me just a second. But you guys keep coming back Tuesday nights. Anchor down.